Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. Tonight, our panel of medical experts will be taking your questions about the diagnosis, treatment, and potential complications of diabetes. I'm Dr. Alan Johns from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth, and I'm your host for tonight's program. We're ready to take your questions. Give us a call locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. Here to answer your questions are this evening's panelists. Dr. Ryan Harden, a family physician with Gateway Family Health Clinic in Sandstone and a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. Dr. Nahi Kablawi, an endocrinologist with Essentia Health Duluth Clinic. And Dr. Jake Powell, an internal medicine specialist with St. Luke's Internal Medicine Associates in Duluth. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Rachel Heinze from Lake Crystal, Minnesota, Christine Lindholm of Virginia, Minnesota, and Aaron Mustanen from Little Falls, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on diabetes. Well, diabetes is a you know very common. Uh, condition in our country and in our state and in this region too. Uh, Dr. Harden, maybe we should just come up, what, what, is it, what is diabetes? What's the definition of it? What is it? Well, <clears throat> diabetes is a general term that's used to explain conditions in the body that, where the body loses its natural ability to, to maintain and regulate blood sugar levels. But generally, there's two types of diabetes. There's type 1 diabetes, where the pancreas, which secretes insulin and helps lower uh, blood glucose levels, loses its ability to make insulin. And there's a, a, the more common type of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, is where the body loses its ability to respond to insulin that's manufactured in the pancreas. Thank you, Dr. Kablawi. What, what, what kind of symptoms do patients have, or do they have symptoms with diabetes? Well. Um Initially, m m many patients might not have any symptoms or might not notice any differences, but once the blood sugars really start rising, typically around 200 uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter or above, they do start noticing that they're urinating a lot more than usual. Um, they get uh, more, uh, more hungry, uh, more thirsty, so they're drinking more water, uh, dry mouth, um, and um, fatigue. Uh, weight loss also happens frequently in some patients, especially if it takes them a while before they really recognize the, the problem and the, and the diagnosis. Well, thank you. Speaking of diagnosis, uh, how do you, uh, Dr. Paul, how do you diagnose, di diagnose diabetes? Uh, typically, uh, we'll diagnose it, uh, you know, a combination of things. Usually it's a, a combination of patient symptoms along with blood work. Um, di diabetes is not a diagnosis you can make just by looking at someone, so you have to have a, an idea whether they're at risk for it. That includes family history and other oh. symptoms they may have. Um, we'll commonly do screening blood sugar testing on people with a strong family history of diabetes or other risk factors such as being overweight or uh, a condition we call metabolic syndrome or high cholesterol. Uh, typically it's made showing an elevated fasting blood sugar or more commonly these days we use another blood test called a hemoglobin A1C which is, uh, has kind of become the, the standard test for diagnosing someone with diabetes. Thank you very much. Dr. Harden, our first caller from Duluth would like to know what is the cutoff for A1C values for prediabetes? Maybe we should talk about prediabetes first and then we'll get to that question. So what's that? So uh, diabetes is, prediabetes is a gradual progression in the body's, the body losing its ability to regulate blood sugar levels. Uh, physicians have decided that they'll determine that somebody is diabetic when their blood sugars reach a certain level such that they have an A1C of 6.5, but an A1C of 5.8 to 6.5 generally is referred to as pre-diabetes where those patients don't actually have diabetes, uh, but they're at high risk for developing diabetes if measures aren't taken to prevent that. Well, I think one, and then the, 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 there's another question here regarding the cutoff values for that also, a normal range of A1C. Maybe we could just get back and ask uh, Dr. Kablawi, what, well, what is the A1C? I mean, what does that mean? 
So the A1C is the measure of how much glucose is attached to the, to the hemoglobin that's circulating the blood. And it's a good method of actually um, estimating how, over the last two or three months, how much the, blood, the average blood sugar was in the blood. So it gives us a good estimate rather than the typical blood sugar uh, measurement, which is an instantaneous measurement and which can change greatly in a short period mm -hmm. of time. Uh, so A1C is that are above six and a half, uh, uh, basically mean that an average of roughly 140 or above, which is much higher than what a normal blood sugar should be. A normal blood know. sugar should be what, 126? <coughs> Well, that's for the definition of diabetes on right. fasting blood sugar, 126. But right. really, most normal blood sugar is actually below 100. Okay. Uh, to roughly, roughly between 70 to 100. Some people can even tolerate into the 60s and don't have any problems. Thank you very much. A caller would like to know about metformin, um, which is one of the most common medications given for type 2 diabetes initially. Um, is that, I, is that something that's given for prediabetes or diabetes, or what's the role of metformin? Uh, metformin is a, um, is it typically for most practitioners, it's our initial drug of choice for treating type 2 diabetes. Um, metformin helps your body to use insulin uh, more efficiently. It helps your body use its own insulin. We will use it occasionally in people who are prediabetic. That's kind of a... Um, I guess practice style for, for some physicians, uh, uh, but there is evidence to show that if you start someone on metformin who's pre-diabetic, they do get some of the same benefits as someone who's technically a diabetic. Um, uh, there are some side effects with metformin, GI side effects. Some people have uh, occasionally diarrhea, upset stomach, but in general, most people tolerate it well, and it's our, for most of us, it's our first line drug of choice for, for type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Um, when you have a new patient with, with type 2 diabetes, what other than just giving medication, what other advice do you give patients? Well, the, the reason that we um, want to treat type 2 diabetes is because prolonged elevated blood sugars can cause uh, damage to the eye, they can cause damage to the kidneys, and they can cause neuropathy, which generally presents as numbness, pain, or tingling in the feet. Um, so when somebody's initially diagnosed with diabetes, um, and, and we manage that with medicine, that can, it can also be managed with diet and exercise. You know, it, they can adjust their diet to de decrease their blood sugars, and certainly exercise, just exercise it itself, um, helps to maintain blood glucose levels. But in addition to treating them, recommending diet and exercise changes, uh, we'll screen for, for um, changes in the eyes or kidney damage or uh, neuropathy, which is, uh, can be, pre as I said, present as numbness or tingling in the feet. Uh, Dr. Kablawi, one of the mm -hmm. things that's uh, been mentioned in the last few years is that most diabetics don't die of their diabetes itself. They die of cardiovascular complications. Is that correct? Well, it depends on how you look at it because actually diabetes does increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and other diseases that will ultimately end, end death. So in my view, diabetes is is a killer. It's not the immediate cause, but definitely it's the it's it's what makes everything worse, um, and leads to worse outcomes with with cardiovascular or other diseases. Here's a good question. Uh, a caller from Duluth would like to uh, Dr. Powell would like to know how accurate are the home testing devices for determining blood glucose? Uh, they're fairly accurate. There, I think there's. I, my understanding is a range of error in those devices anywhere from 10 to 20 percent on average and uh, so it gives you a, a good estimate of where you're at um, uh, I think most uh, diabetics will we recommend checking your blood sugar at least you know once a day in the morning typically for most people um, but there is a range of error so you may you may check it uh, at six in the morning and it reads a uh, hundred and you might check it five minutes later and it reads 90 but it's it's generally within that 10 to 20 percent range. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, I'll, and there's another question here too I'll follow up and I, uh, I, it's a good question. I don't know the answer exactly. Do you need to replace the unused testing strips every three months like it says? I know there's, there's a cost to all of this. There is. I think they're probably still pretty good after three months. Yeah. That may be a way to get you to buy more. I'm not sure about that. But <laughs> yeah. I, my bet is they're still probably still pretty good. But that is an expense, you know, when you're talking about, uh, about for patients. Uh, this all adds up. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was a good question. Yeah. Yes. I was just going to add, Please. some of the newer 
some of the newer machines actually will not allow you to use the old or expired strips. Oh no, it will actually right? say it's expired oh, and they won't. They just can't it. fool them. Yeah. Oh, that's that's too bad. Fortunately. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Harden. So the, let's say we have a patient and you advise them to, to get on the proper diet and lose weight, and we put the person on metformin and their A1Cs are high, and you see them in a few months, and things haven't budged a whole lot. What's our next step with a type 2 diabetic usually? Well, if somebody has type 2 diabetes and they're initially treated with metformin, which is the most common treatment for that, um, and we implement diet and exercise changes, after a couple months, if, their A1C, if there's no change in their A1C, there's a couple of options. Uh, one option is to add another uh, medicine, an oral medicine, that can help lower their blood sugars and effectively lower their A1C. Um, or if their A1C is, is relatively high, it's reasonable at that point to start insulin therapy. Okay, so insulin's not just for type 1 diabetics. Type 2 diabetics are also That's right, on and it. everybody who has type 1 diabetes needs insulin to survive. People who have type 2 diabetes, if it's poorly, relatively poorly controlled and they're placed on insulin, uh, that can be very effective. Generally, they need higher doses than somebody who has type 1 diabetes, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an option for people sure. with type 2 diabetes. Sure. We have, uh, Dr. Kabal, we have a uh, caller from Friedenburg Township. Good question. What is diabetic ketoacidosis, and how is that different from just having diabetes? So diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the more, or, or one of the complications of having diabetes, and that typically happens when the blood sugars go very high and unchecked, and that, what, what, and that leads to changing or alteration of the chemistry of the blood, and ultimately uh, uh, the blood sugars will be high, uh, the, the, the blood will have uh, acidity, so, so uh, will, not move, you know, will not move very well. And if it really gets bad, I mean, you can start having failure of, of the body's function. And typically, the treatment would require not just insulin for treatment, but also a correcting for the acidity uh, by, mm -hmm. um, you know, correcting for, for potassium and, and correcting for sodium and giving them lots of fluids because you usually patients at that point um, are dehydrated, uh, meaning that they, they don't have enough um, water or fluids in their body, so they need to be replaced uh, for, for successful treatment. And that's more, much more common in type 1 diabetes? A lot right? more common in type 1. Rarely happens in type 2. I mean, it can happen, but it, it's much more common in type 1, and they're much more prone to it. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hart, uh, Dr. Um, Powell, what would we? What would you do with a patient who um, doesn't want to go on insulin? How do you? How do you say uh, this is? And I've had these discussions mm -hmm. with sure. patients. They say, "I don't want that needle." Yep. No, I yep. don't want that needle. Yep. Well, ultimately, it's their <laughs> choice. So, if someone absolutely refuses insulin, we can't force it on them. I always make sure patients are aware of that. Um, there are. There's probably uh, three or four groups of, including metformin, of oral medications we can use. Very rarely will we use three or four, but, but it's an option. Um, there's, a, there's a different type of injectable medication that's not insulin that works quite well. Um, of course, focusing on diet and exercise, even considering something like weight loss surgery, if that's appropriate. Uh, there's lots of options, but ultimately, if someone needs insulin and they refuse to take it, um, they're, they're making a poor decision and, and they're putting their health in jeopardy, but there are people who are, will say, no, I'm not going to use it, and there's, there's uh, a few that you just can't talk into it. Um, oftentimes with good education and, and helping them to understand how insulin works and the, today's insulin delivery mechanism is are much better than it used to be. It's more or less painless. Uh, yeah, so the usually, needles are just tiny. Very small, very just fine. Amazing. Yeah, very, very, and so usually you can talk them into it, but there's a few you can't, and you just have to work around that and, and give them some other options. Sure. Very good. Dr. Harden, a uh, caller from Cloquet would like to know what causes injection site bloating and swelling when insulin is injected into the abdomen? It gets a little hard, she notes. Well, there can, anytime you inject something, uh, from outside of the body into, inside, into the body, that can cause a little bit of a, a reaction from the body to what's been injected. And it just much like if you get a bee sting or something like that. Um, also, when the fluid is, that contains the insulin is injected, that can cause a little bit of uh, swelling of the tissue that can cause uh, a little, where patients will feel like there's a little 
subcutaneous mass or mass under the skin in that region. Very good. Um, I guess our next question here is from uh, a gentleman up on the Iron Range, wondering about dr new, newer drugs such as Invokin and that can uh, lower blood sugar. How effective are these drugs? I guess uh, this, uh, Dr. Kabali, this gets to the whole topic of the, the newer medications that are available. So most oral medications, including these medications, typically drop the, the the A1C moderately, meaning they, they're, they're fairly effective, but it's going to depend on lots of factors, including uh, what was the starting A1C. But usually you can see a drop of about 1%. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to metformin and, and similar to lots of other drugs. M many of the other oral drugs are, are, are weaker than that. But on average, um, these newer drugs uh, do drop it by about 1%. Okay. Some people, of course, might have better outcomes and it drops it more, uh, but that's, that's the average. And what about the newer injectable drugs? The newer injectable drugs, um, so uh, and the non-insulin injectable right. drugs, of course. Uh, so these usually drop it again roughly by one, maybe one and a half percent. They're, they're a little bit better than the oral medications, especially that most of these injectables actually also help cause some weight loss which I think also plays a role in, in improving the diabetic control. Thank you very much. Dr. Powell, a, a uh, caller from Duluth would like to know, uh, an adult with type 1 diabetes, is there a tendency for blood sugars to rise at night after a busy work day? Uh, I, I, I don't know about the busyness of the work day. I think uh, people will have varying changes in their blood sugar at night. Uh, if you have a snack late in the evening, uh, you go to bed, your sugar's gonna go up. If you don't eat anything after dinner, it's probably not gonna go up, it may go down. Uh, so as far as correlation to the workday, I'm not aware of any. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Harden, I'm gonna ask my own question. I have that, I have that <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> okay, think that, that I'm an intern, a general internist, and I don't see children, uh, much like Dr. Dr. Powell, but I understand children now have type 2 diabetes. Some children have type 2, which is just kind of a, a horrible thought for, for me. I mean, uh, related to obesity. Is that, is that right? It, absolutely, that's true. Um, general, because that never used to happen. That's right. We, we used to think that type 1 diabetes was diabetes of the young, and type 2 diabetes was diabetes of, of older people or mature people. But um, there are certain younger individuals under 18 or even younger than that that are developing type 2 diabetes. And that can, uh, their ethnicity can play a role. Certainly their uh, being overweight or obese plays a role in that. But um, type 2 diabetes is definitely becoming more common in, in uh, the pediatric population. Wow. Do uh, Dr. Kablawi, a uh, caller from Chisholm would like to know, uh, Diet's not that great, not getting that much exercise. Uh, blood sugars are uh, typically 180, say, to 200. A1C is 8%. How long can this person maintain these numbers before getting complications? Oh. <clears throat> Get your crystal ball out. <laughs> uh, well, very difficult. I mean, you can't just have one bad meal or get under stress like an other illness or an infection and the blood sugars would rise very quickly. I mean, blood sugars um, like heart rate or, or blood pressure changes you know, in, in a moment's notice. And so they can rise very quickly. I mean, someone, you know, type two, because they still have some insulin function of their own, are a little bit more resistant. Type ones, even in, in three, four hours without, mm -hmm. you know, w under, under stress or, or without their insulin can, can even develop diabetic ketoacidosis that quickly. So, but so I the think changes maybe complications, they're worried about de developing eye problems or kidney problems. How long does that take? So it takes years. The, okay. the problem is m lots of type 2 diabetics have had years of uh, maybe even diagnosable diabetes, but because, you know, they, they don't see their doctors, they don't right. get so they may have enough had screening, it much so they've actually had it much longer. Oh, sure. So, so that's why the, the recommendations is that once you get diagnosed, you get, um, you know, you, you, ha you get screened uh, for all of these diseases if you're type 2. But they, I mean, they do, they do take years, but typically about 5 to 10 years when you really start mm -hmm. seeing changes. Great. Here's an interesting question. Dr. Paul from Grand Marais, are there conditions that mimic symptoms of diabetes? 
Uh, there are. There's other endocrine disorders that can that can mimic diabetes. Um, symptoms of diabetes, as was discussed earlier, often thirst, excessive urination. There's kidney disorders that could potentially cause those symptoms. Um, so certainly there are other uh, conditions. There are not many conditions that give you the specific laboratory abnormalities that diabetes does. And so if you're concerned about diabetes, if you have any of those symptoms, see your doctor and your doctor can do the appropriate tests and, and figure out exactly what's, what's causing those symptoms. Dr. Harden, how often should a patient with diabetes see their physician? Uh, generally speaking, un until diabetes is well controlled, um, people should see their physician at least every three months. I have some patients with diabetes that see me um, every six months if it's very well controlled, but generally every three months, unless they were just diagnosed. Some patients with type two diabetes or type one diabetes, if it's very poorly controlled, and especially those with type one diabetes, they're gonna have to have more frequent visits uh, with their physician for the first couple months. But for the most part, once it's well controlled, every three to six months. Thank you. Dr. Kablawi, uh, now when we talk about insulin, there's another question here. What about insulin pumps? Now, how are they used and whom are they used in? So they're, they're typically used in type, two, type 1 diabetics because okay. um, uh, uh, the control of type 1 diabetics is much more difficult than type 2s. And uh, insulin pumps allows lots of variations and lots of changes in the insulin um, as the day progresses that you can achieve uh, with a pump that you cannot achieve with just an injection. Uh, some type two diabetics um, can, can be also put on a pump. Um, it's important to remember that the pump use is actually not easier than the injection. It's actually more work, but uh, if you do that work, you'll get better rewards. You'll get much better control of your blood sugars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Powell, a caller from Sandstone, would like to know, uh, are there differences between the different types of long-acting insulin, say Lantus versus Slevomir? Mm -hmm. Is there, are there? Yeah, there are. There's, there's uh, molecular differences as far as how they're absorbed and, and that's the main thing, how they're delivered, um, their solubility, their pH, the kind of subtle biochemical differences, but for the most part, they when we're changing one per a person from one long-acting insulin to another, it's usually more or less a one-to-one -one conversion, meaning they'll require about the same amount of one long-acting insulin as they did another. Maybe not exactly, but pretty close to help control their blood sugars. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harden. A uh, caller would well, like to know what's the difference? What's the differentiating factor between controlling diabetes with diet and exercise, or with medications? Well, certainly I'd prefer, and they'd probably prefer it, that they could manage their diabetes with diet and exercise, and many people can. Um, but if somebody has diabetes and type 2 diabetes and we try and uh, regulate that with diet and exercise, if they're not able to do that, then I would at that point probably recommend they start a medicine. Sure. Certainly if they're symptomatic anyway. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a call regarding, uh, from the Iron Range regarding Genuvia. Can you, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Kablau, can you tell me a little bit about that? Or? So um, Genuvia is a class of, is one of the class of medications that uh, it basically works by uh, inhibiting a molecule in the, in, in the blood that uh, would otherwise have um, degraded another molecule that's important for uh, efficient uh, insulin function in the blood. So, uh, so it's it's one of those good drugs. Um, typically, doesn't have lots of uh, bad side effects. Well tolerated. Uh, usually, about maybe half a percent of A1C um, improvement uh, is expected. Expensive? Usually. Is it expensive? It's, you know, it's still it's still brand name, so it is you know, it is oh, somewhat sure. expensive. Yeah. Certainly. And Dr. Powell, we're getting near the end here, but um, got some really good questions. Uh, uh, a uh, lady from Bayfield calls, uh, 82 years old. It sounds like she's of normal weight. Uh, her doctor told her that uh, she was pre-diabetic and she should stop eating pasta. And she's worried about uh, her weight, that she might actually lose too much weight. Uh, is there something that she needs to do to control her diabetes? Or Well, certainly some real simple dietary changes people can make to help control their diabetes include eliminating high, high carbohydrate foods such as pasta, potatoes, white bread, 
sugary beverages. Those are the big ones I kind of harp on. Okay. Um, but as far as losing too much weight, she's un really unlikely to get to an unhealthy weight just by cutting out those things. Okay. Great. Sounds like she's not, you know, good weight already. Yeah. So very good. Well, we'd like to thank you tonight for clo uh, our panelists, Dr. Ryan Harden, Dr. Nahi Kablawi, and Dr. Jake Powell, and our medical students. Rachel Heinze, Christina Lindholm, Aaron Mustanen. Please join Dr. Ruth Westra next week for a program on circulation and leg problems, when her panelists will be Dr. Mark Edgerton, Dr. Paul Sanford, and Dr. Gregory Snyder. Thank you for watching, and good night. <laughs>